So a very good morning. And I would like all of us to turn to Psalms 29. And don't we love Psalms? Psalms 29. Let us read uh, Psalms 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes for flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Blessed is the name of the Lord. I would like to invite Brother Yen Ling to lead us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to our morning worship service. Shall we all rise to sing our opening hymn? Your beauty fills our eyes. Very good morning to one and all. It's good to see all of you this morning. For our scripture reading this morning, would you turn your Bibles to the book of Romans? As I mentioned, uh, we will actually be starting on this book next week, a new uh, expository series in the book of Romans. And even as uh, I have been um, really studying the responsibility that members of the church have towards uh, one another, 
I'm reminded of uh, what this particular chapter says about um, our responsibility to one another as uh, the body of Christ, the church. So we're going to read this passage responsively. I'll read the first verse, you read the second verse, and we will uh, proceed in that fashion uh, right through to the end of uh, this chapter. So Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May the Lord bless the reading of his words to our hearts. Not sure about you, but uh, this morning I was ministered to by the two passages in our church-wide scripture reading, Lamentation chapter 3 and the 34th Psalm. Really speaks of God's faithfulness that is new to us every morning. 
And Psalm 34, written by David when he was so desperately trying to run away from King Saul that uh, he pretended to be a madman. He was apparently very convincing in his act, but even in his days of desperation, he runs to the Lord to really be ministered by Him. So let us be encouraged by what the Lord is doing and allow our hearts to be renewed by Him each day. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and the words of praises be on our lips at all times. We would boast in you and magnify your holy name. And this morning we are gathered together to exalt your name together. Father, we remember that there have been times in our lives where it hasn't been smooth sailing, what the psalmist call going through the valley of the shadow of death. And in those days, we have cried out to you. And Father, our testimony has been that just as you have delivered David from all of his troubles, you have also delivered us from our suffering as well. And Father, we would pray that you would transform us so that those who look to you, their faces will be radiant and their faces would never be ashamed. And we all acknowledge with David that we are all poor, poor in spirit. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Father, we are glad that the angel of the Lord encamped around those who would fear him, fear you, and they deliver us. Oh, may our testimony this morning be that we have tasted and we have seen that you, our Lord, you are good. And blessed is the man who takes refuge in you. Oh Lord, help us to continually fear you each and every day. Because those who fear you have no lack. Our testimony is that you have been the faithful provider for all of us. So, Father, teach us to fear you. Father, may our lives be wholly dedicated to you. That when we live our final breaths on this earth, we might look back and be able to say that we have done what we can for the advancement of your kingdom. That our days have been used and not wasted because we have desired our own pursuits. O oh Lord, keep us from the idols of this world. They are so attractive. And they are always seeking to derail us, to distract us from doing what is the best. Keep us from evil. Help us to do what is right in your eyes. Father, we are thankful that you are for the righteous, that you turn your ear to 
towards those who cry out to you. That your face is against those who do evil. And that when the righteous cry for help, you do hear. And you deliver them from all of their troubles. Indeed, you are near to the brokenhearted. And you save the crushed in spirit. O oh Lord, for those this morning who are brokenhearted, who are crushed in spirit, Father, this morning will they find in you to be their comforter, to be their deliverer. And may their testimonies be that, yes, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord deliver him out of them all. May that be our testimony to acknowledge this precious truth that you are ever with us. O oh Lord, we pray that you would forgive us because so often, due to our afflictions, our minds are turned to other things we, which we think can help to soothe our souls. And we turn to these things to deliver us. But Lord, even as we look back, we realize that these are empty things. They may be able to relieve us for a moment. But ultimately, we run back to you. You who bring, you would bring us out of the desert, of the dryness of our soul, back to the wellspring of your goodness. And so, Father, grant to us just such a testimony. Help us this morning to draw close to you. Help us to taste and see that the Lord is good. We ask all these things in your Son's most precious name. Amen. For our next hymn, please take our hymn book and turn to hymn number 21, Ferris Lord Jesus. Hymn number 21, Ferris Lord Jesus.
Yes, crown him with many crowns. We want to thank God. That do you know that you will receive crowns too? What a beautiful thought. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, Lord, how great is thy faithfulness. Indeed, your mercy is anew each morning. O oh Lord, as we see the sun rises each morning, the breath that we inhale. Oh God, these are your grace upon us. Father, we thank you. And you don't stop there, Lord. You have provided for us all these years. We have provided Grace Independent Baptist Church for the past 43 years and counting. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Father, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Father, we can put our hope and our trust in you. Teach us, O oh Father, to obey you. Father, we thank you for those who have been giving to the ministry of the church cheerfully. O oh Lord, bless their heart, bless their souls. Father, we thank you for what you have done and will be doing and continue to do for this church. Thank you for this body, this body of Christ, that, Lord, we are all made differently, but we are all made in the image of our Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for all those that you have made and contributed to this church. Lord, we thank you. We ascribe, you, we ascribe to you, Lord, your glory, Lord. Thank you, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.
you ladies for the offertory. For the final hymn, shall we all stand to sing uh, hymn number 34, hymn number 34, Oh How I Love Jesus. Shall we all rise to sing the final hymn before the message? Last week we began our series, really just a two-part um, series on the topic of biblical church membership. And for those uh, who are involved in our membership class, uh, last week and uh, this week will be the second part of um, the class. What we saw last week is that... Um, Church membership uh, is taught, something taught implicitly in the New Testament. 
And what we've seen is that many of the things that were done in the early church really couldn't have happened if there were no system akin to something like membership. There is some kind of a list, some kind of a role uh, where people are in or they are not in. And what I did was, at the conclusion, then really coming to a definition of what membership entails and trying to put together some of the significance of what membership is. And here is the membership. This is a definition that I have provided last week. That is a believer's willing and voluntary entry into covenant with a local church. Notice it's something done by a believer. An unbeliever uh, is not able to do that. Subscribing to and defending his doctrinal position and contributing to his growth and purity. And I kind of broke it up and explained each part in greater detail. Now, I just want to make a clarification before we launch in uh, to this final section. From what I said last week, now when we talk about the church, when the Bible, when the New Testament really talks about the church, it does talk about it in two senses. Two cents. First of all, there is something called the universal church. Sometimes as theologians call it the church universal. And as that term implies, it has reference to believers throughout all the ages, throughout history, uh, really from all over the world. And that is the church, when our Lord says that, you know, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is referring to the church universal. And we can say that the universal church from every language and tribe and nation will gather together the last day to praise the Lamb that was slain. And really, that is that authority that our Lord speaks about when He gives His authority to the church to carry out His will, um, that our Lord really is head over that. But then, in there are many, many instances in the New Testament that really refers to the church like the way we are gathered here this morning, what we call the local church. Now, as you can imagine, the universal church is, everybody's a member. If you are a truly born-again believer, you are a member of the local church, the local assembly. I mean, you're a member of the universal church, I'm sorry. Um, but then we realize that there are certain things that really is not doable in just the universal definition of the church that can only happen in a local church. Well, that's, this is what we are in here this morning. A local church simply is a gathering of believers in a physical location, like this morning we are gathered here in this location, 547 Upper Changi Road. And gathering together and purposing to come together to covenant together for worship, to carry out the ordinances, which there are two of them. Which they are baptism and the Lord's Supper and in fellowship and in service, as in serving the Lord. And from the book of Acts, we have seen that it is the Lord's will for new believers to be gathered into local churches. We saw right away that they, that they met together and back then, they were just started. There's no building available that, that was purposely built for, to, to house the church. And they met in houses. In fact, what we can see from the New Testament is that most of Paul's letters, and he wrote most of the New Testament, right, out, out of the 27 books, in the New Testament, 13 were written by the Apostle Paul, many of them written to local churches. For example, he wrote two inspired letters to the church in Corinth. He wrote one to the church in Rome, one to the church in Ephesus, two letters to the pastors there, to the pastor there, Timothy. Timothy was the pastor in the church of Ephesus. 
he wrote two letters to the church in Thessalonica. One to the church in Philippi. One to the church in Colossae. One to the churches in the region of Galatia. One to the pastor in Crete. He is Titus. So while every true believer is a member of the local church, not everyone is a member of a... Okay, while everybody is a member of the universal church, not everyone is a member of the local church. And the wisdom of God really is in organizing His people into local bodies for the purpose of carrying out His will, such as the administration of care, for one another, for the flock. And another important aspect would be accountability. accountability, Things which are difficult to achieve on a universal level. So with that, I will conclude the series today by examining the call to church membership and really what it entails. You know, um, our church covenant really encapsulates the responsibility of every church member. It is not my purpose to go over that document, which is very important uh, this morning. Uh, And there are books you can read about it. Later on, I will show you some of those books and all that, about what it means to be a healthy church member. I I want to encapsulate some of these things really in three broad categories. And here is uh, an outline of what we are going today. That the call to church membership is a call to, number one, mutual submission. Mutual submission. Number two, patient love. Patient love. And number three, fulfilling what the scripture calls us to do towards one another. One another. All right, so... Looking at the first point, the call to church membership is a call to mutual submission. You know, you can say that, you know, a person should join the church as a member. It might be more biblically accurate to say that Christian, okay, when they join the church, they submit to the church. We talk about the authority in the church given by the Lord last week. All authority is given unto me, and then he commissions the church. And what we need to clarify when we say this, first of all, is that it is not just a submission to the leaders of the church. Although we have talked about this a couple weeks ago. Because this responsibility to submit to the church applies to the leadership as well. I want to show you really two verses that really speaks of not just submission to the leadership, but mutual submission. Would you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5? I mentioned and we, we, when we were in the series in the book of Ephesians, that really this particular book uh, has a lot to say about the church. It has a lot of rich theology about the church. And here, the Apostle Paul is going to show us Look in verse 18, he says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, so the topic here is is what happens when a believer is filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, in fact, we can say it this way, what happens when a church is filled with the Holy Spirit? He's going to give... Number one, in verse 19, that they are then going to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what we just did this morning. Number two, in verse 20, they are going to give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And number three, the third evidence of a person or a church being filled with the Holy Spirit is this, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You see that? Three evidences of a church that is filled with the Spirit. They sing to one another, they give thanks to the Lord, and they submit to one another. And Paul explains, if you look at the next book, if you flip, flip to Ephesians chapter 2, or Philippians chapter 2, that one of the ways by which this mutual submission is carried out, look at verse 3, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, is this, is to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. It is the need to consider others more significant than ourselves. So you see how that this is actually carried out, and, and here, who is called to do this? Well, everybody, including myself, including any church leader. There is a call to mutual submission to one another. Now, actually from verse 3, we can actually see two hindrances to this being carried out. The hindrances to mutual submission. We see, first of all, in verse 3, Paul says, do nothing from, number one, selfish ambition. Well, what is selfish ambition? It is a personal agenda that is driving a particular individual to pursue his own thing. Now, sometimes it's not just merely a person driving his own personal agenda. It can even extend to driving a particular family's agenda or a close friend's agenda and so on. And, and, and this really hinders this mutual submission. And if you think about it, church membership, because membership is corporate in nature. Okay, think about this word. The English word corporate comes from the Latin word corpus, which simply means body. And the things you do in the church should contribute to the body. Some of you here are medical personnel. And you know that in your body, when you have cells, they are not doing what it should do and is going in a separate direction. Okay? We call these kind of cells what? Cancerous cells. Cancerous cells can only do harm to the body. Okay, I think I was told that you know, we, we have cancerous cells in our bodies all the time. It's just how much uh, is it in our body. Obviously, over a certain limit, we need to take care of that. But there are things in our body that help us defend and fight against these cells. But really, if you think about it, someone that is driven by selfish ambition is almost akin to these kinds of cancerous cells that is not really contributing to the prosperity and the growth and the advancement and the flourishing of the body. And it doesn't help that we live in an increasingly individualistic world. You have a slogan, right? Be yourself, do your own thing. What other kind of slogans do you have that, that really speaks of you know, how you shouldn't let other people hinder what you want to do, you should, you should pursue your own agenda, drive you know, whatever you want to do. And, and, and really, a call to church membership is really countering that kind of tendency that we all have to live our lives as individuals. 
And a person pursuing his own selfish ambition will have no interest in participating in corporate activities because it runs counter to his own agenda and objectives. And you all remember what James says, right? We were in the book of James uh, recently, chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. James says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. You know, all you have to do is to open up the headlines in the newspaper every day and you will see countries that are ridden with Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, tearing the nation apart. This is really how the world works. Every man for himself, right? And such individual driven by such an attitude will find it hard to join or submit to the church because it's going to hinder what he wants to do. He will not have the quote-unquote freedom to pursue his own agenda. But we see that another hindrance here, we see in verse 3, Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Well, what is conceit? That's pride, right? It's excessive pride in oneself. This is someone who has an elevated view of himself. Naturally, he will feel no need to submit to others, but rather that others should submit to him since his views are the best and most correct ones. Once again, this person will also find it hard to participate meaningfully in church membership because the church will either slow him down or the church will pursue things he disagrees with and with methods he disagrees with. And so really, in order for mutual submission to take place, there is a need for humility and a filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So once again, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. You know, folks, it is not an easy thing to do, isn't it? Sometimes it can be hard. We struggle with these things. I'm not saying that it is something easy just because we preach about it, that we can easily do it. We really need the Lord to really help us in these things. Let me remind you that wisdom from above is characterized as this James chapter 3 and verse 17 and 18. Wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, partial, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In the same manner, Paul in Ephesians 4, we read this chapter last week. The first three verses, he says, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So really, a call to church membership is a call to mutual submission. And we can see some of the hindrances uh, there is to these things. But also a call to church membership is a call to patient love. You know, last week I, I compared entering into church membership. There's a lot of similarity with entering into a marriage covenant. A lot of similarity. The advice I give to couples that I meet with for premarital counseling is that 
at this time, before you go enter into marriage, you really open both eyes really wide. Is this the person you're going to spend your entire life with? Okay, and then, if that is what you decided, both of you have mutual agreement, when you enter into the marriage covenant, covenant you shut one eye, you shut both eyes. Because the opposite happens, right? When a couple is dating, they choose not to see those things. They choose to ignore perhaps certain, certain glaring things. And then when they enter into marriage, they, opens both eye, they open both eyes real wide and they say, I didn't realize you're like that. People join the church they open both eyes very wide and they say, I didn't realize you all are like that. Which is why one pastor advised that you should only join the church after you have been offended by, by someone in the church. And that is said because Even though we are a people of God, gloriously saved by the Lord, redeemed from our sins, but we are still sinners. Still sinners who fail from time to time. Still sinners who need to regularly go go to the Lord to confess their sins before the Lord. And for those of you who have been a member of a church for any length of time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, there is an expectation, I think, that we, that we, that, that we as, people, as people of God have sometimes, that, that we should consistently act and respond in a Christ-like manner. But the reality is, sometimes we don't. And all of us are still dealing with our fallen flesh and we are always tempted to react in a fleshly way. And we are reminded that regardless of which individual Christian we are talking about, that person is even the best of a believer is still a sinner at best. We have experienced disappointment, failures of others. Perhaps someone has offended us. And we don't consistently walk in the spirit as we should. Which is why there is Really, you know, when I go through scripture to look at all these commands given to one another, one another, one another, one another, these verses kept coming up. And I can group them this way. From our Lord Jesus Christ, John 13, 34, 35, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. John fifteen twelve. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. John fifteen seventeen. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. And this command is echoed by his apostle Paul. In Romans 12:10, he says, Love one another. We read this morning with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Romans 13 verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love, one, to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no, one, no need for anyone to write to you, For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Who teaches us to love one another? It's God. 
once again, we are reminded that this, this is something that we cannot engineer. You can't learn this from a textbook. You can't take a course to, to love. It is something taught by God himself. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. And that brings joy to the Apostle Paul. This is not the only, this is not the only Apostle that has this to say from our Lord's Apostle Peter. 1 Peter 1.22, he says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. 1 Peter 4.8, above all, keep loving one another. Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. From his apostle John, 1 John 3.11 For this is the message that you have received from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John 3.23 And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Chapter 4, verse 7 Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, once again. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Chapter 4, verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. Second John, verse 5, And now I ask you, dear, dear, dear lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Of all the responsibilities that we have towards one another, this responsibility to love one another occurs the most frequently in the New Testament. Do you know why? Can I have you turn to 1 Corinthians in the 13th chapter? You know this chapter as the chapter of love. And in verse 4, the Apostle Paul begins to describe what love is. And the first thing he says is, love is patient. In our King James, it says, charity suffereth long. Is love in the New Testament akin to romantic feelings? Absolutely not. In what situation do you have to be long-suffering towards someone? In what situation do you have to exhibit patience with someone? Someone you're madly in love with? It is the person who has offended you. It is the person who has hurt you. It is the person who has said something unkind and un inconsiderate to you or about you. You see, the reason why love is repeated over and over and over again. Love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. Why? Because the fact is, over time, over time, when you draw close to one another, 
what inevitably happens when believers who are saved from their sins but still sinners draw close to one another? What inevitably happens? Offense will be given, offense will be taken. I think you all know that very well if you have been in the church for a while. In every single local church, that happens. Of all the things the Apostle Paul can start to begin describing what love is, he says, okay, before I talk about anything else, I want you to know that when it comes to loving people, you have to first of all evidence it by suffering long with the individual. Because there is that need. If you, you think about the friendships that you have with individuals, you know, you, you, have been a, you, have been, you have this best friend over a long period of time and all that. Can you describe this individual as someone who is perfect? Never ever offends you, never, ever, never, does, just never do anything wrong and so on. Well, the reason why your friendship continues to exist with this individual is because you have chosen to do what? To overlook this person's faults. You have chosen to accept this person, his or her warts and everything. And that's how, if you think about it, that's how a relationship continues to exist. And if you, have think, if you think about, you know, in your own life or in the life of some other people that you have observed, the reason why a friendship is terminated, for example, is because one or both parties have decided that they are no longer willing or able to put up with this other individual. And they decide to part ways. Okay, you think about marriages that have gone in separate ways, where the parties have gone in separate ways. Isn't that what happens? It's exactly, it's exactly what happens. I can no longer stand you, you can no longer stand me, I think the best is for us to part ways. And that happens in churches as well. But you know, being long-suffering is, an, is, a, is a passive thing. And here the Apostle Paul speaks about it in a, a, the other part in an active way. Okay, someone offends you, you return that offense with what? Love is patient and is what? And is kind. You return that offense with what? Kindness. You say, that is impossible to do. Yes. In your strength. Guess who teaches you to, be, to love? The whole context of the description of love is in situations where someone has offended you, someone has hurt you, someone has said something unkind, and all that. That is, okay, we often bring this up in, you know, someone, you know, a pastor would give a short message in, in a wedding day and say this. And you know what is applicable in marriage as well? The, the newly married couple probably doesn't think about this, but give some time where that romantic feeling kind of wanes away, and then this has to apply. This applies in the marriage relationship, putting up with one another. Those of you who are married, are you married to perfect spouses? 
you know the answer to the question. Why are you still married? You're exhibiting patient love. You're married to this local church. Why are you still married to this local church? Is it because this local church is perfect? No. It is full of warts and imperfection. You have chosen to exhibit patient love. That's why you're still here. You belong suffering towards one another and you return offenses with kindness. Something absolutely impossible to do apart from the grace of God. And folks, the fact is, if you're going to have years of meaningful church membership, whether it's here or elsewhere, this is the attitude you must come into church membership with. This is the attitude you enter into a marriage covenant with. When the honeymoon is over, See, folks, the fact is, when an offense has been given or received, the scripture already told us how to get it resolved. Doesn't mean that it's easy or instantaneous, but, if we, but the Bible already tells us how to solve these issues. And in instances where we do not follow what the Bible says, there really is the absence of God's blessing. But when we do, when we say, okay, look, this, this, this is what the Bible says, it's not easy, but here's what the Bible says about how we should resolve these issues. There's blessing in that. And, and, and there really then is the, is, 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 is the Holy Spirit exhibiting His power in a believer's life. You know, folks, Sometimes we are surprised when another believer doesn't act in a Christ-like way. In fact, we should actually be surprised when someone actually does follow what the Bible says. Because the normal way we act, the default way we, we respond, is to respond in a fleshly, carnal way. And every time we respond in a Christ-like way, it really is the grace of God at work in a person's heart. So, folks, there is the need to enter into this covenant relationship, bearing this in mind. But then finally, let's take a look at the need for us to fulfill our responsibility towards one another. You know, we saw last week that the Bible often described the church as the body. Christ is the head, we are his body. And a healthy body is one when every member of the body is functioning well. Right? A sick body is where something is not going well, something's wrong. When some parts of the body is not doing well, the whole body is affected. Well, what is needed then is to heed what Scripture calls us to do towards one another. And you know, folks, sometimes we may feel, man, are we really a body? Sometimes it feels that like we are a bag of marbles. What happens when you drop a bag of marbles? The bag opens up and the marbles rose everywhere. You know, I think oftentimes we feel that way because we are not doing what the Bible calls us to do in fulfilling our responsibility towards one another. That's why we feel that way. What I have done basically is to go to the Bible, New Testament, and to search for every single reference 
of one another, one another, one another, one another. And I've just put it, I just, I've just categorized it, put it as category, and here is the result. One thing that scripture calls us to do is to care for one another. We can call it care for one another physically. Okay, there's a physical way, the physical helps and the meeting of needs. Our Lord says, Matthew 25 verse 40, Truly I say to you, as you did it, what is doing it? Okay, feeding, you know, those who have no food, you know, giving him drink, clothing him and so on. As you did it to the, one of these least of my brothers, you did it to me. Think about that. Paul says in Romans 12, 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. For example, in Romans 15, 26, for Macedonia and Achaia, Achaia refers to the church in Corinth. Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make contributions for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Galatians 6.10, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Do good to everyone, especially to those who, who are those people? Of the household of faith. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, Hebrews 13, 16 says, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. 1 John 3, 17 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Is Grace Independence Baptist Church known for caring for one another? That is a question that even as a membership of the church ought to be asking one another. And really, we need to follow up with the question, right? How have you contributed to the care of one another? We are told, secondly, to watch over one another spiritually. Okay, you care for one another physically, but there's a need to watch over one another spiritually. Romans 15, 14 Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. And here, 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 he says something interesting. Able to instruct one another. The word instruct is the Greek word nuthateo, which can also be translated as to counsel one another. And it is the context of watching over one another. You know, it is not like Remember Cain, right? Cain and Abel. When God asked, so, so, so Cain was filled with jealousy, he killed his brother because God accepted Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain's sacrifice. And he killed him. Cain killed Abel. And God asked Abel, where is your brother? And what was, Abel's, uh, what was Cain's response? Am I my brother's keeper? When it comes to church membership, and the question is asked, am I my brother and sister's keeper? The answer is, absolutely. Galatians 6, 1 and 2, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should do what? Restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you to be tempted here it is, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
How are you doing in bearing one another's burdens? Philippians 2, 4, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Are you occupied day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out with your own interests? We're very busy, right? We are very busy people. Is it busy simply with our... If you think about how many percent of your time you are busy with your own particular interests. Second Thessalonians 3, 13 to 15. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. That is church discipline right there. But do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Love him that way. Watch over him that way. We all know Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another every day as long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Whose responsibility is this? The pastor's responsibility? One another. One another's responsibility. We are called to edify one another. The word edify simply means to build up. What we do and say should lead to the spiritual flourishing of another. Romans 15, 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. So with yourselves, since you are eager for the manifestations of the Spirit, that means all these gifts, sign gifts, strive to excel in building up the church. 1 Peter 4, 10. As each has received a gift, which all of God's people have received at least one spiritual gift. Use it, Peter says, to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Hebrews 10.24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You know, some of these commands are are, are hard to categorize. They can go into other categories as well, you know. So I think, you know, this is just not a hard and fast category. But here, then, another command to serve one another. Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, for your own personal fulfillment, but through love, through love, serve one another. And how about this? 1 Peter 4.9, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Okay, let's just pause there. What does it mean to show hospitality? Probably the first thing that comes to our mind is inviting people to our homes. And that certainly is a wonderful thing. You know, and you may not want to invite people to your home. You may want to invite them to the coffee shop or the food court or restaurant, whatever. That's fine. But there is something about opening up the home that is, for the lack of a better term, homely. You understand what I mean? There's a saying, right? Home is where the heart is. Do you view your home as not just a castle that you go into at the end of the day, then you draw the, 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 the bridge up? You know, you know what I mean? A castle is always surrounded, you know, by a moat, you know, it's a little, you know, canal or whatever, and then you draw the bridge up and says, no one can enter into my, into my castle. It's just from I, me, and my family. 
Or do you view your home as one that you can open up to others? You see, but my home is very messy. So someone said this to me last time that I find very helpful. They say, okay, my home is very messy. If you want to come and see me, come anytime. Because you're not coming to see my house, you're coming to see me. If you want to come and see my house, let me know ahead of time so I can clean it up. I think it's very interesting. Peter knows us. He says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. You know why he does add the term without grumbling? Because apparently we do, you know. Huh? Open the house, the house of other people and all that. Okay, be and all that. You know, da, 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 I keep my house clean and all that kind of thing. I, 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 don't, I don't really cook and all that. What do you do? Buy back food and all that. Show hospitality, what? Without grumbling. Come. Come. Come to the house. You can come to my house. It's very messy now. We have full of boxes. But if you're coming to see us, come anytime. Okay? Come anytime. Okay? No pressure on my wife or anybody. Okay, so we talked about loving just now. Here is another command. Bear with one another. You know what that means? <laughs> Once again, okay, and there are many verses here. I check all references, they are all accurate. Uh, as in the numbers and all that. Sometimes, you know, I, I make a mistake here and there. Mark eleven twenty five, And when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Romans twelve sixteen. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, proud, but associate with the lowly, the humble. Never be wise in your own sight. Romans 15.1 We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Romans 15.5 May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. Galatians 6.2 Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We saw that just now earlier on, but this also can fit here. Um, Ephesians 4.2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in, in love. The Hokkien has this term, right? They call it Cao Kuan. What kind of Cao Kuan do you have? That means uh, all the bad, you know, all the negative traits of a person. Okay, all the smelly traits of a person. Bear up with his Cao Kuan. We can put it this way, all right, to put it in Singlish. Maybe we understand it better that way. Be kind, Ephesians 4.32, be kind with, to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Why? Because they have offended you. They have not been kind. They have been insensitive. Whatever. As, as God in Christ forgave you, as God in Christ forgave you, that's why you should forgive them. Colossians 3, 12 and 13, put on then as God's chosen one, okay, you put on clothes to come this morning, right? Put on what? what? Holy, holy and beloved, okay, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if God has a complaint against, if, if you have a complaint against another, which you from time to time will do, will have, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Do you have a complaint right now against someone else in this assembly? Forgive. Forgive. James 4.11 Do not speak evil against another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. James 5.9 Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And then this, sing. You have a responsibility to sing with one another. I don't understand. Some people, they come to church and they, they don't open their mouth to sing. And I think, you know what? Into eternity, you will not hear a sermon. You will know all things there is to know. You don't need a sermon. 
Uh, you also don't need to clear choke toilets. You may not even need to cook. I, I, okay, the one, you know, I, I, I don't know. But I think some of you will be very disappointed if we don't have to eat. I mean, it's like, what? I thought, you know, we have the measures. Like, okay, okay, so, so maybe, maybe that's not the case. But you know what you'll be doing into eternity? You will be singing praises. And notice what Paul says in these two places, Ephesians 5.19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And remember, this particular passage is in the context of someone who has been filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, notice how it happens, okay? You are filled with the Holy Spirit and then you sing these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The charismatic, get it wrong, the opposite, okay? The charismatic must say, I sing these things first and then, oh, I have some kind of interesting, funny feelings in my body, some kind of high, then I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. You are filled with the Holy Spirit first and then you come to church to sing these songs. The songs do not fill you with the Holy Spirit. Some people come to church for the, for the music to have that kind of effect in them. No, no, no. The, the, the music and all that is a responsibility. It is a command from God for you to, to exhibit as an evidence of the Spirit filling in the church. Filled with the Spirit and then sing. Not sing and then feel the Holy Spirit. The order is very important. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How? By teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. Okay? I'm not here commanding you all to sing. The Holy Spirit is. The Bible is calling you to sing. You say, I cannot carry a pitch. Never mind, doesn't matter. Just sing. Just sing. Because why? You'll be doing that throughout all eternity. And there is that corporate nature. You do this not individually in your home. While you may do that, our family will sing every night a hymn, all right, as part of our, you know, um, uh, 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 devotion and, and worship to the Lord but when we come together the responsibility is for us to sing with and to one another and then obviously we pray for one another Paul says Ephesians 6.18 praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to the end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. James 5.16, we saw this when we were in, the, in, in the book. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. That's why I continue to call. If you're a member of the church, your responsibility is to pray for one another and the way we do that, we have a corporate time to do that, which is our Wednesday prayer meeting. And folks, if you think about it, these responsibilities can best be carried out in the context of church membership because members have covenanted with one another to do this. Therefore, you should not be dating the church. You should be married to it. Just as you don't date around and live with an individual, you get married to the person. You all know the famous Baptist preacher, Charles Hayden Spurgeon. He calls the church quote, the dearest place on earth. Unquote. The dearest place on earth. The local church, not the universal church. 
He explains, quote, Nothing in the world is dearer to God's heart than His church. Therefore, being His, let us also belong to it, that by our prayers, our gifts, and our labors, we may support and strengthen it. Spurgeon feels that the church is the dearest place on earth. Do you agree? Do you agree? You know, it is very easy to allow our warmth and our affection for the church, towards the church, to slip away. Because we have seen so much imperfections in it. But the fact is, the church is dear to our Lord. He died, shed his blood to redeem a people called from the world unto him. And yes, the church at this point in time has a lot of imperfections. Warts and all. And the members here will fail you. I will certainly fail you. They may offend you. I have certainly offended different individuals. But one day, this bride of Christ will stand with her bridegroom, clean, spotless, faultless, pure. One day that will happen. And when you join the church, would you think about and look forward to that day? Rather than looking back in the past with all of the experiences that you perhaps had, but look towards that day in the future that is to come where all of those blemishes will be removed forever. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. O oh Lord, create in us in an attitude that is driven by your word. We know that there can be no transformation apart from what only you can do in our hearts. We look forward to how this body can be one day a perfect body because it will be filled with members who are perfect. There is only that call for us to take our sanctification at this point seriously. There are flaws, there are weaknesses, there's disobedience from time to time. Father, grant us grace to grow out of these things. Father, I pray that you help us to submit mutually to one another. Help us to exhibit patient love, especially in situations where we are offended, where 
or we offended others, help us to get right with them. Help us to be willing to raise these things as your word has called us to do so. Help us to fulfill our responsibility that we have covenanted with one another to fulfill. And may the church be the dearest place on earth for us. For in Christ name we pray. Amen. We turn to a very familiar hymn, 219, Bless Be the Tie That Binds. Let's stand together and sing this hymn that really speaks of our responsibility towards one another. stanza is what we are looking for. Amen. Be seated.